right, well, welcome. Um, I'd like to introduce Craig Gilbald. He's here to teach us about ends of manifolds for three lectures. Okay, thanks for showing up, and thanks to uh, Jack for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I want to put my name up here, but also uh, UW-Milwaukee, because I know that Oberlin has this uh, tradition of producing really good uh, math majors. So if you're looking for a graduate school in the future, uh, keep us in mind. Uh, we've had at least one Oberlin student come to Milwaukee and, and did a great job and gone on to do good things. So I'd be happy to talk to you about that if you're interested. OK, so um, when, when looking for a topic to talk about, I wanted to do something that would be different than what you would have already seen in, in the topology class you're taking, um, but not so different that uh, you feel like you're in the wrong class. So I, um, I, I think the topic I have here will, will fit that. So let, let me say, first of all, that uh, I'm more of a geometric topologist than a general topologist, so we're not going to be looking at uh, at spaces with quirky, unusual properties. Right, right up front, I want to say that uh, I'm going to assume that all spaces are are relatively nice. So, so they're going to be assumed to be. And I'm going to give a, a list of properties that uh, that I would like them to all have, separable, um, locally compact, um, and metrizable. So we don't necessarily have to have a metric, but if we wanted to put a metric on it, we could. So right away, you've got all the nice properties, Hausdorff, regular, normal. Those are going to come for free. Um, you could do a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about without that, but just, just since I've only got a few days with you, I want to focus on the really interesting stuff and not some of the nitty-gritty uh, details. Um, in addition, um, um, We'll normally assume uh, path connected and locally path connected. I, I guess I could just say connected and locally path connected, those will fit together. So Okay, so one of the reasons for this, um, I realized that, again, if I want to cover a lot of ground in a short time, rather than prove a lot of theorems, I'll state a lot of exercises and let you fill in the details of things that, uh, that I, I know you'll be able to figure out anyway. So um, first of all, when you have separable and metrizable, x is second countable. Recall that means it has a countable basis. Um, so in fact, um, not only does it have a, a, a countable basis, but it has a countable basis, each of whose elements has a compact closure. OK, so side countable. In fact, x has a countable basis. each of whose elements has compact closure. OK, and that's going to give us a starting point for a lot of stuff we're going to do later on. And so let me make that the second part of the exercise. Um, so once you have that, uh, You can see that x contains a sequence. Uh, I'm going to call these guys CIs. 
of compact subsets um, where each CI is contained in the interior of the one that comes after it. And so that uh, if you take the union of the CIs, you get the whole space. Okay, so we call such a sequence. An exhaustion. Okay. Okay. So the idea is you want you want to be able to fill your space up as a union of bigger and bigger compact sets, a, a countable union. Okay. So you start with a C1, C2, and you just keep going, and you fill the whole space up. You can come up with weird spaces that don't have that property, but for most spaces that a geometric topologist is interested in, uh, that, that condition isn't, uh, well, that condition isn't too extreme. Okay, now I want to remind you of a definition that I, I'm sure you don't need to be reminded of, but it'll help compare it to a definition that comes afterwards. You recall that X is homeomorphic to Y. If, well, I, I want to state it in a way that uh, leads into the next definition nicely. So, uh, one way to say it is if, uh, if there exists continuous functions. So first of all, we like a function that goes from x to y. We'll call that one f. But I also want a function that takes us from y back to x. And the properties we want is, well, we want those functions uh, to be inverses of one another. So we would like uh, g composed with f to be equal to the identity function on x and f composed with g to be the identity function on y. I could have just said that f is a bijection with a continuous inverse, but I want to talk about uh, a variation on this definition where the function doesn't have an inverse, but we do have a function that plays a similar role. So, uh, before I state that definition, let me set some notation. When I when I will say that two spaces are homeomorphic, I'm going to use this approximately equal to notation. Is that what you use in, in your class here? Yes. It's interesting that it seems like topologists have never quite agreed on what they're... <laughs> After years and years of topology, we, we've never quite agreed on what the right notation is for a homeomorphism. So that, that's the one that I use anyway. Okay, so of course the, there are the standard examples that sort of identify topologists as a little bit strange amongst mathematicians. So to a topologist, a circle is the same thing as a square, which is the same thing as a triangle. When I say I do geometry and I say I don't know the difference between a square and a triangle, that <laughs> sort of makes people wonder about me a little bit. But uh, certainly you can get a continuous bijection from the circle to the square. If this, if this uh, circle is made of wire, you would just bend it around and you can make it look like either of those. Uh, and so we have that. Uh, sort of simple one. There's, of course, the famous example of the topologist not knowing the donut from the coffee cup. Um, I won't try drawing that one. But uh, well, let me mention another one, which is that, uh, well, let's just do it this way. The, the unit interval is homeomorphic to the entire real line. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about like spaces at infinity and you know what do, what do I mean by things at infinity? Well, keep in mind that uh, for me these two spaces are the same. So infinite distances aren't re really going to be required. And so I'm going to have to uh, to define a notion of infinity that doesn't depend on, on large numbers and things being far away. Uh, topological versions of that. Uh, okay, but I, I wanted to comment on the variation on this definition of homeomorphism, which I think you've seen, but this was always a definition that it took me a while to get comfortable with. And it's a useful thing to to think about today, and that's the notion of a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so the, the variation on that definition, it's almost exactly the same definition, but you'll see the difference. X is homotopy equivalent to Y. Okay, and let me squeeze the notation in here right away. If I'm going to say homotopy equivalent instead of homeomorphic, I'm going to use this symbol. Okay. Um, if there exist continuous functions, same as before, I want a function from x to y, and I want a function from y to x. And I want their compositions to essentially be the identity function. I would like these to be approximately inverses of one another. And so, I'll say what this means in a second. Again, you may already know this, but uh, no harm in reviewing a little bit. Okay. So the difference is the compositions don't have to be the identity on the nose, which uh, is going to allow f and g to not necessarily be bijective functions, but uh, what this means, of course, I'm using the same symbol for two slightly different things, but they're in the same spirit. This means that those maps are homotopic. And is everybody good with the, the general notion of a pair of maps being homotopic to one another? Okay, and if, if there's anything I say at some point that uh, you're not familiar with or you need me to, to remind you of, uh, feel free to, uh, to slow me down or stop me. Okay, so um, topologists spend a lot of time trying to come up with, with methods for telling when two spaces are homeomorphic to one another. Um, are proving that they're not homeomorphic to one another. E even simple spaces, you know, if you, if you take a two-dimensional sphere or a two-dimensional torus, uh, all the general topology in the world doesn't usually help you distinguish between those spaces. And so we, we need to sometimes go to some extremes to be able to prove that uh, the one space is not homeomorphic to another. The, the fundamental group is a great way of doing that. Um, you know, you, you introduce some abstract algebra and suddenly you can see that the, the two-dimensional sphere really is different from the torus, not because of any general topology properties, but because of their fundamental groups. Now, the good news and the bad news is really um, homotopy equivalence um, is also an invariant, or, Fundamental group is also an invariant under homotopy equivalence. And so I want to comment on why that's a good thing and also why that's a bad thing, and then show how we can kind of overcome the, the bad parts of that. So, um, so, so in this case, we call, uh, well, 
call the maps F and G. Oh my god, I for that. As opposed to the maps being actual homeomorphisms themselves. Okay, so the examples I want to think about here. First of all, one of Topology's favorite spaces is just the unit circle, so I'll put that down. Um, so that's S1. That's homotopy equivalent to an annulus. Okay, and when I say the annulus, I'm just talking about the space, which is a circle crossed with an interval, 0, 1. And in fact, that's homotopy equivalent to the entire plane R2, if I just remove the origin from it. So, let's put a hole right there, and hope that this picture sort of indicates what I'm thinking about. So R2 minus the origin. Okay, clearly those spaces, well, I don't know about clearly, but fairly clearly they're not homeomorphic to one another. Uh, but it turns out that uh, they're approximately homeomorphic in the sense of homotopy equivalence. One way you can see that this thing is homotopy equivalent to the circle, but the map that just squashes down the interval factor and projects it back onto the circle. Certainly not uh, bijective, but it, it's good enough to be a homotopy equivalence. And as far as the punctured plane being homotopy equivalent to a circle, if you were just to draw the unit circle in here, you could now sort of push everything from the puncture out onto the circle and everything outside inwards you could deform that object onto the circle. And uh, with a little work, you can convince yourself that, in fact, uh, the function that takes this circle to that circle would be a homotopy Okay, I want to toss in a couple other examples. The second example I had in mind to think about was uh, If you take that object in the plane, it's sometimes called a theta curve. It really is just that. It's a circle with a segment across there. That's homotopy equivalent to the figure eight space. And that's homotopy equivalent to what you get if you go back to the plane and instead of removing one point, you remove two points. So let's think about the plane. Just to keep things symmetric now, I'll leave the origin there, but I'll remove a point over here, and I'll remove a point over here. And it turns out that uh, this space is homotopy equivalent to either of these. It's not too hard to see that, because you can build that figure eight space inside here, And then you can kind of play the same game as before. You can deform this punctured space, twice punctured space, onto that pink figure eight by pushing out, if you're inside one of the petals of that uh, flower, or pushing things in from the outside. Okay, and uh, let's see. I want one more collection of examples. The real line. itself is homotopy equivalent to a one-point space, as is the entire plane, R2, because the function that just squashes the entire real line down onto, let's say, the uh, the points, the, the, the number zero in the real line, 
that can be deformed to the identity function. And so this is, this is uh, pretty extreme, right? Those spaces clearly not homeomorphic, but uh, homotopy equivalence uh, puts them all in the same category. Now here's one nice thing about that. It is that if you want to calculate the fundamental group of a space, the fundamental group is not only a topological invariant, but it's a homotopy invariant. Okay, actually, let me let me toss in an exercise here. I'm, I'm guessing you've seen the definition of a contractible space. Okay, so no, notice that being contractible is actually the same thing as being homotopy equivalent to uh, the one-point space. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make that an exercise. So x is contractible. If and only if the space x is homotopy equivalent to your favorite one-point space, P. Okay, so now let me do the upside of homotopy equivalences. illustrated by, for example, this theorem which says that if your spaces x and y are homotopy equivalent, then uh, the fundamental groups are isomorphic. It's sort of a given that when you define fundamental group, you would like any two spaces that are homeomorphic to have the same fundamental group. That's kind of the point. But this sort of just comes along for free, that in fact, they don't have to be homeomorphic. They only have to be homotopy equivalent. And the reason I say that's an upside is because if you go back to these pictures here, if you want to calculate the fundamental group of one of these families of spaces, you can just pick the easiest one in that homotopy class. And if you can do that, then you've knocked off the others as well. Okay, so um, so notice you're, uh, you're not seeing the word proof coming after this, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that for uh, Jack. If you haven't, there, there, there is a little issue here about about base points, and it's, it's a little bit of a, um, an awkward thing to deal with. But, but what I've said is, is true, in fact. Uh, keep in mind that my spaces are assumed to be uh, connected and path-connected, so uh, base point really doesn't uh, matter too much, but it, it does uh, figure into the proof a bit. Okay, but the applications... You know, suppose you're sitting in an analysis class, and one of, one of the sort of spaces that's quite uh, important to you there is often you, you've got something like uh, the plane, maybe it's the complex plane, or maybe you're not doing complex analysis, but you, you remove some points from it, and you'd like to know something about the fundamental group of that object. So if you're, let's just say you're looking at R2 minus the origin. I'm going to avoid mentioning the base point when, when I can get away with it. So uh, I recognize there should be a base point there, but let's just skip that. Um, you know, that's a pretty enormous space with a tremendous number of loops in it. But since it's homotopy equivalent to the circle, it's all we have to do is calculate the fundamental group of the circle. And of course, 
we've got that. Okay, also, you know, the, the twice punctured plane comes up quite a bit. Pi 1 of R2. If you subtract a pair of points now, I didn't give those names, let's just call them arbitrarily P and Q. Well, if you know how to calculate pi 1 in the figure 8, let me just write down figure 8. And is that something you know the fundamental group of? Okay, well, we'll probably talk about that a little bit later on. This turns out, the, the group theory gets interesting quite fast. I'm going to say this is isomorphic to F2. And this is something called the free group on two generators. Heard of that one before? It's quite interesting because in some sense it's, it's well, depending on how you look at things, it can be viewed as the, the simplest non-abelian, infinite non-abelian group out there. Very, very non-abelian, in fact. And it's a little surprising, I think, often to people when they first meet the fundamental group to realize it doesn't have to be an abelian group. And uh, that turns out to actually be a good thing. It'll, it allows, uh, it gives you a lot of... Uh, ways that you can use topology to analyze really interesting groups. So we'll, we'll come to that. Um, but anyway, the, the, the point is that the, the figure 8 is such a simple space that I think by the, by the uh, end of the semester, for sure, you will have, have seen exactly why the fundamental group of figure 8 is this. And, and then it, uh, it allows you to understand the fundamental group of, of these more complicated spaces. Well, let's, let's look at the downside of this. The, the downside is that uh, a lot of spaces have the same fundamental group, which a lot of spaces you would like to distinguish from one another also have the same fundamental group. And that's a bad thing because, you know, you, you have this pair of spaces. You'd like to explain why they're not homeomorphic. You calculate the fundamental group and you realize you didn't get any information. So let me, let me introduce a collection of spaces that all, in fact, they're all going to be homotopy equivalent to a point, which means the fundamental group is essentially useless in those cases. But as soon as you see the spaces, you'll see that uh, they're nothing like one another. Okay, so the downside... is that spaces that are much different uh, are still homotopy equal. And so, for example, the fundamental group isn't going to help you out. So, so I want to introduce you to a collection of spaces that we'll come back to um, time and again here. The first space I want you to think about is just the, uh, the half line. Okay, just start at your favorite point. Start at zero, for example. And when I'm talking about this space, I'm going to denote it by R plus. It's important that I want, to keep, I want to keep the point zero in there. So I want this endpoint here, and then I just want to go in one direction. Uh, nothing against the real line. That's our second example of a space that we will want to think about. Um, the third example, I want to sort of combine these two. I want to take the real line, and I want to glue a copy of the half line to it. And I want to look at this space right here. 
Okay, so if you know, this is the rail line union, we'll take the origin and cross it with with a half line. I think that notation is good enough to describe what the space is. Okay, I want to, I want to describe two more spaces. They get progressively more complicated. The next one is just a variation on this, but I want to take that real line. And at every single integer, I want to put in one of these half lines. So at zero, I do this, but I also do it at one and two and three and so on. And also for all the negatives. Okay, so I can use that same notation. It's uh, R union. Let's see. I'm taking the integers and I'm crossing it with the half line. Again, I realize my notation can be more precise, but I'm also trying to keep it concise enough. Okay, and one more that I want to throw at you is what I call the, the uniform trivalent tree. It looks like this. So I'm going to start with a point, and I'm going to start branching out in three different directions. So let's just go this way, this way, and that way. And then I'm going to put an endpoint on each of those intervals. And then I want it to look the same at each of these points. So I've already got one direction here, so I'm going to go out in two additional directions. I really want you to think of each of these intervals as being one unit long, but if I draw them all the same length, it's, I'm going to run out of space. So I'm going to draw them a little shorter as I go out. But, you know, we're topologists, so we can think of them all as being the same length without actually having to draw them that way. Okay, but I want to do this forever. Now I put an endpoint on each of these, and I go out, and I branch out. I do that up here. and discontinue everywhere you go. Okay, so the notation I use for this, I, I like to use the letter T for tree. This object is, if you have ever done any graph theory, this is a tree. Um, in fact, I like to use blackboard boldface font here, T, and I call it T3 because it has this property that the index at each vertex is So we have five different spaces here. What, what do you notice about all five of them? It's kind of a vague question, I guess. <laughs> From the point of view of what we're doing here, um, notice they're all contractible. <laughs> it's pretty easy to see how to contract them, right? Uh, you know, the this thing, you just deform everything towards the base point. The real line, again, just pick the origin. Everything comes in. For this one, just take you know, this is a convenient point, and just contract everything towards that point. And here it's a little bit more of a challenge, but first squash everything down. <laughs> That's step one, and then step two is then fold up the real line, or squash it down to a point. As far as this uh, trivalent tree here, just for every point, there's a unique path that takes you back to the origin. Just have every point start walking towards the origin, and uh, that's going to define for you a contraction of that whole thing down to the point. If you're far away, you have to walk faster than the guys who are closer, but you can actually write down a formula even for that contraction. Now, I think you'd agree that those spaces are not all the same, but if we tried to prove that they're different, certainly the fundamental group is going to do us no good whatsoever. But that doesn't mean you couldn't attack the problem right now without anything that I'm going to tell you today. Although, for, for some of these, I think you would probably run into some, some difficulties. But I, actually, I think it's a nice challenge anyway. 
And that is to, uh, I'll put this as an exercise too. And that is to come up with some strategies for distinguishing these spaces from one another. In other words, if your job was to prove that these spaces are not homeomorphic to one another, in other words, choose any two and figure out a strategy for distinguishing those. Okay, so, so an exercise. Well, so, so note, <laughs> the first thing is note that each of these is contractible. So for example, the fundamental group is of no value. Well, the fundamental group always has value, but <laughs> If, if your job is to distinguish one from the other, it has no value. Um, okay, but an exercise is to uh, formulate strategies for proving that these spaces are not homeomorphic to one another. That shouldn't be too hard between these first two spaces, right? There, clearly this space has a, a point with a property that no point on the real line has. So you should probably be able to work with that. And in fact, that might help you here as well. It starts to get tougher over here. I'm not, not saying you can't do it, but I, I'm going to show you some an approach that, uh, that sort of takes care of all of these things at, at the same time. Okay, so the idea that I want to introduce is what really makes these spaces different is they look different at infinity, whatever that is. So, um, so that's the idea that I, I want to uh, eventually make mathematically precise that they are different because they look different at infinity. develop a theory of infinity to make that precise. here. I really kind of want to leave these pictures out, so let me erase something that I have written up only recently. I'll, I'll leave the, the bottom half there. Okay, so here's the definition that will be useful to us. Um, a subset A of the space X is, and I'm going to insert the word topologically here, and then I'm going to throw it away as we go forward, but I want to contrast this to a definition you may have heard before. <coughs> 
because I want to define the word bounded. Now, bounded has a special meaning in a metric space. A subset's bounded if you can choose a ball that's big enough that it contains it. Um, but I, topologically, I want to say it a little bit differently. I'm going to say it's bounded if its closure is compact. Okay, so it's bounded if A closure is compact. That's useful for dealing with, uh, you know, I, I want to think of the open interval from minus 1 to 1 as being the same as the real line. Now, this space metrically is bounded, and so every subset would be bounded, but you know, that, that's sort of missing the point. There is still the stuff out near the ends of this space, and so this definition works much better if you don't have a, a metric around that's... Uh, it's doing the work for you. Okay, so, so again, in the future when I say bounded, think about the topological version of boundedness. Okay, and now what I want to do is define a neighborhood of infinity. So we're, we're beginning to make, you know, infinity is this elusive concept. It depends on how you define things. And so I want to talk about a neighborhood of infinity. So, n, a subset of x, is a neighborhood of infinity. And it's all I mean by neighborhood of infinity is if uh, its complement is bounded. That's the definition, so I don't need to justify it too much, I guess. Um, and now, here's a definition that will begin to help me distinguish between these spaces. Um, I say, I'm going to say a space X is k n. If k is the supremum, in some other thing here. Uh, let's, let's do this first. Um, for any subset of x, I want to define uh, an integer. Well, it doesn't have to be an integer. Let uh, u of a now this is going to be either a positive integer or it could be infinity. And it's all u of a is is the number of unbounded components. Oh, so clearly if I define what bounded means, unbounded just means it's not bounded. I won't write that down. So for a subset of x, u of a be the number of unbounded components. Okay. I'm guessing you talked about components in your class, components of a space, the, the largest connected subsets. So the, you know, every subset can be viewed as a, the, the piece is made up of the connected chunks of it. And so we go with that. And, and then I can say, that uh, x is k ended means that uh, k is the supremum of the number of unbounded components of a neighborhood of infinity. The largest u of n, where this n is a neighborhood of infinity. Okay? And notice here that the supremum is allowed to be infinite, so 
can be infinite. So we've, we've got these pictures here. And so here's some nice examples to test this idea. What you would do is to get, to, to get a neighborhood of infinity, you just start, what, what I usually do is I start with a compact set and I look at its complement. So for example, in R plus, I could start with that much stuff. And then the neighborhood of infinity is the complement. And I count how many components it has. Well, is that the complement has two components, but the only ones I really care about are the unbounded ones. So um, there's just one unbounded component. And if I make that compact set big, <coughs> or even if I choose it to be ugly, you know, so that it's not connected, um, I'm going to leave some extra components, but persistently it's going to have exactly one unbounded component. So if you looked at the half line and you said it has one end, this is a mathematical way of making that precise. Uh, for the real line, notice that as soon as you take a compact set that has at least one point in it, you can have a lot of complementary components, but very quickly you settle into a pattern where you have exactly two unbounded components. There's no way that you can put a compactum in there so that you have more than two. It's just <laughs> It's the nature of the space. This one's a little more interesting, and if you start with a compact set that lives over here, you have two unbounded components, but eventually, if you make that compact set bigger, you're eventually going to hit this point, and you're going to have a situation where you have three unbounded components, and so, and, and then you're not going to do any better than that. Here, again, remember, you've got to start with a compact set. So let's, there's only so far you can go this way with a compact set. Right? And there's only so far up you can go. And it's kind of interesting that uh, if you believe that space has infinitely many ends, you would be right. But you're never going to get a compact set whose complement has infinitely many components. Notice here we have one, two, three, and then we have this big chunk, and then this other big chunk, so we have five unbounded components. If we make that compact set bigger, we can increase that number. It'll always be finite, but the supremum is going to be infinite, and so this is an infinite endless space. Okay? And a similar thing happens here, which, uh, you know, if as long as you remove that vertex, you've now split it into three pieces. And if you, if you get big enough so that you contain the next sort of layer of vertices, now you go from having three pieces to having, remember this point has been removed, so you have two on each, so you have six pieces there. And obviously if you make that compact set bigger, um, the number of unbounded components increases, and so you have infinitely many spaces. So we now have a rigorous definition of some sort of notion of infinity, which allows us to prove that of these five spaces here, um, this one, this one, this one, are all different from one another, and they're different from these guys. Uh, unfortunately, um, this business of k-endedness, when, when they're both infinite-ended, we still can't quite distinguish between these two spaces. This is the most stubborn one. And uh, what I would like to do the next time we get together is develop this theory a little bit further in such a way that it will allow us to uh, have a more detailed theory of infinity that distinguishes this space from that space. So I think that's how, that's how much time I have, right, Jack? Yep. Okay. That uh, seems like a good place to stop. So if the equivalence is like one with the tilde and then a line and then a tilde with two lines, what's the difference between those? Oh, uh, okay. So, so the tilde with two lines 
Notice I use that between the fundamental group. That, that means isomorphism of groups. So some, the algebraists have their act together. They always use this symbol to stand for isomorphism, although they have group isomorphisms and ring isomorphisms. And so, uh, but yeah, when I use that symbol, it's usually an algebraic uh, 